first thing to say is that um, there's a, a, a slower paced uh, version of this uh, workshop in case you find I talk too fast or, or you know, there's like too many new concepts and stuff. So you can get everything that I'm going to demonstrate, the vulnerable applications, uh, a recording, the slides, everything in Service Secure Commons last free. So it's completely free. And there's like a, a one hour and a half, like slower paced uh, version. So if you find I'm talking too fast or like this is a little bit challenging, uh, you know, there's like a, a second kind of slower uh, version. So today we're going to talk about hacking JavaScript desktop apps with XSS and remote code execution. So first I'll give you some introduction about, uh, about this. And then uh, from the perspective of like, maybe some of you have never audited an electron application. So I'll give you like some essential techniques about how to get started, how to get like some findings without having any idea, right? So we'll talk about that first. And then we'll see something which I believe is really interesting is what does XSS mean when you get it in a desktop application as opposed to a web application, right? What, what can you do? And there's a lot of interesting scenarios that we are going to, to see today. Um, and then we will see like how to exploit them and how to mitigate them as well, right? And then how to turn XSS into remote code execution and then attacking preload scripts will, will also be a quite interesting in concept because it's kind of prototype pollution, but in the context of a desktop application. So I'll go through that and then Another very interesting concept, which is getting remote code execution through inter-process communication, right? So we'll talk about all those things. So I'm Abraham Aranguren, I'm the CEO of 7A Security. Uh, we do pen tests and training. Um, so I was teaching the web course <laughs> a couple of days ago here at Alaskan as well. Um, and yeah, I'm co-author of uh, our web, uh, mobile, and the desktop application security courses that we have. We've done security training at Black Hat, Hacking the Box, OWASP Global AppSec. I'll be uh, at OWASP San Francisco in a couple of weeks as well. Uh, you know, lot, lots of places. Um, now, since this is an OWASP conference, I'm also the project leader of one of the OWASP uh, flagship projects, which is OWASP OWTF. So if you are interested on this, it's kind of hacking OWASP, you know, to have OWTF somewhere. <laughs> so if you go to OWTF.org, if you type this in your browser, I'll take you to the OWASP page. So this is uh, a project more about like hacking uh, web applications, but still um, interesting. Now let me fix one thing that I just noticed. So I think that will look better now, yes. <laughs> So, okay, uh, and yeah, and I was a developer first, and then I went into security, right? So I know like both sides, right? I know for developers, it has to be working in production on Friday, <laughs> right? Doesn't matter how you do it, it has to be there, right? And then I know the frustration of pen testers, like why are you not fixing my bugs, right? So uh, I got your back, basically. Right now, uh, one of the other things that you can have, see on the website is public pen test reports. So these are a little bit older about the Chinese police, so you can search on YouTube for Chinese police and cloud pets. I gave a couple of talks about this, so some basically auditing. So this, all these pentest reports are like completely free, like you can like check them out. You can also watch the talk. Uh, if you go to YouTube, Chinese police and cloud pets, you can see some uh, applications, small applications written by uh, Chinese police, Chinese government. So it was kind of a public safety audit to look for like, are they sp spying on people or not? You know, that kind of stuff. Then Smart Sheriff uh, was an application mandated in South Korea, so by law, every parent and child was forced to install this application. So we also did an audit of that. Basically, everything you should never do in a mobile application can be summarized in these two pen test reports. It, <laughs> it was so bad that we even gave a talk about it, so you can <clears throat> search for Smart Sheriff Dumb Idea on YouTube, and you, you can see a, a talk about that. And more recent, I don't have that in the slide, we did a pen test this year for um, uh, a COVID contact tracing application called Leave Home Safe, which is mandated, kind of mandated in Hong Kong. So basically to do anything in Hong Kong, go to a restaurant, go anywhere, you have to install this app. And so it was also like a public safety. There was a disclosure process. And uh, long story short, uh, man in the middle without warnings in Android, uh, still not fixed after like the 30 day disclosure. 
Uh, then 60 days after, we checked again, still not fixed. So you can read all that <laughs> on the on the site as well. So and there's a bunch of other uh, public pentas reports. So you, this is all in there. Now uh, I have to give props to these people. If you don't, if you're not following them on Twitter, you should. Um, so basically, uh, if if you're interested in XSS, you should follow Masato, right? So when the XSS seems impossible to exploit, he makes it exploitable. <laughs> File descriptor number one ranked uh, bug bounty hunter for Twitter um, for many years. Uh, and insert script has done a lot of research on PDF and how to uh, use in PDF, how to hack into web applications and stuff. So uh, really uh, good people and they all helped made uh, or Electron course better and by extension also this workshop. So props to them. And yeah, this is like in case you want to take or so I'll just skip through this. Um, today, we will see some introduction to Electron, so what it is and so on. And from here, uh, we will be talking about uh, the basics of Electron XSS exploitation, what node integration means, some mitigation essentials, right? So we will talk a little bit about defense, web preferences. So we will see a little bit of these topics and also Electron negativity. I'll have a demo about that from here. Uh, we will attack preload scripts, so this is one of the things we'll do, and we will see a very cool technique to get code execution without warnings in Windows, so if you're into red teaming, some of the <laughs> techniques that I'm going to show will be interesting. Then, uh, we won't see anything of this today, but just to mention that because Electron applications are in the desktop, all the usual like leaks in the local system and so on type of attack vectors also apply then you should always man in the middle a uh, desktop application. We won't see this today, but of course you have to like man in the middle and there's like a few techniques to do this. Now repackaging is also an interesting technique that you can do also in mobile applications, but in desktop applications and especially Electron is even easier because you can basically reverse the Electron application, change the JavaScript, and then you get, for example, you can add debug statements on the JavaScript and then you can see how they are doing their crypto and stuff, right? So you can get a lot of help with that. So, um, and then with instrumentation, you can also see what uh, the application is doing at runtime. But uh, we won't see this today. It's just to mention that it's possible. Uh, and then in here we talk a bit more about advanced attacks. Uh, yeah. And uh, what else from here? I think yeah, we will see that. Yeah, this one. So this is one of the scenarios that we will be talking about today with. Um, getting uh, code execution through inter-process communication. So I'll talk about that. And then this is also an interesting topic, right? So we call this hacking desktop uh, applications, but sometimes uh, we've seen this actually in the field. <laughs> it's possible to run Electron on our website. So uh, there was this website and they were running an Electron app to turn user supplied HTML into a PDF. So you can see where this is going. <laughs> And then uh, you can basically, um, uh, using the attack vectors that I'm going to show today, getting XSS against the, the PDF convert, converter, and then from that you can even turn that into code execution as well on, on the server, right? So even if you're just a web pen tester, I think this talk can also give you like some pointers in case you, uh, you get lucky and find something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then some uh, local attacks for privilege escalation and so on, it's another thing that we cover, right? So with that, let's get started. So. Uh, a crash course about electron security, right? So first of all, wh why would you run JavaScript on the desktop, right? So most of your security people are like, but why, why do this, right? They're like JavaScript on the desktop, seriously, why, right? So, uh, so the first thing is, it's a practical thing for companies, right? So you have, traditionally you would have to pay Windows developers, Linux developers, Mac developers, right? So this is expensive. Now you have three teams, <laughs> that maybe don't get along very well, right? <laughs> there's always like politics in big companies and so on, different deadlines. Uh, I mean, there's, there's lots of more coordination effort, paying more people. But with Electron, now the application is written in JavaScript and magically works everywhere, right? So now you only have to pay JavaScript developers who are probably cheaper <laughs> than Windows developers maybe and Mac developers, right? And now the application magically works on everything, right? It works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, so this is pretty cool, right? So this is the main reason why lots of companies are doing this. And now your next question might be, what companies are doing this, right? So maybe uh, some of these ring a bell, right? Microsoft Teams, Skype, Zoom, Slack, Discord, Big right? So 
uh, very lots of like big companies, right? So it's it's important to know about electron security because lots of big companies are using it as very popular uh, applications. So to understand this workshop, this is one of maybe the most important slides. Let's say um, this is the Discord application and you click on it. Now the first thing that's going to happen is that this, uh, what's called the main process of the application will be launched. And then for each screen that the application has, there will be a renderer process, right? So this will become important now as I delve deeper into this because the main process is less exposed to the user, but it is more powerful, right? So if you have a vulnerability here, you can do a lot more damage. And the render process, because it's more exposed to the user, has more mechanisms uh, provided by the platform. So it's easier through configuration to secure it, right? As opposed to the main process where if you have a vulnerability here, you're pretty much like done, it's over, right? So that is the main difference. So you have the operating system, Windows, Mac, or Linux, then you have the Electron Core, which abstracts everything. And then inside of the Electron application, you have the main process and the renderer process. And they can talk to each other through IPC messages, which is basically a fancy way of saying like inter-process communication. So they basically send JSON to each other, right? And then they can call using Electron APIs to Electron. So that is more or less how uh, an Electron application works inside. So Main process, more privileged, can do more stuff. Render process, more exposed to the user. Normally the XSS is here. Uh, and then both like share some functionality, right? And now everything is built on top of Node.js. So even if this is running on the desktop, it's really all working on top of Node.js. So the typical like Node.js attack vectors in many cases uh, apply. So let's say you have no idea about Electron, you have never seen an Electron application in your life. Uh, how do you get started? How do you get like some vulnerabilities, right? So the first thing to do is to um, download some old uh, public uh, desktop application written in Electron, for example, standard notes. This is a very old version. So over time, there will be vulnerabilities published. Um, and then what you can do is just run npm audit. Now npm audit is a very powerful tool to be aware about because it will not just work against Electron apps, but it will work against any app written in JavaScript. So if you get the source code of a web application or a mobile application written in JavaScript, like for example, Apache Cordova applications, uh, you can run this command and you can get like some findings, like if any dependency is uh, you know, outdated and vulnerable. And this is also um, a very common thing to check nowadays because like the tendency now is you write very little code and you reuse a lot of code and a lot of modules, right? So uh, it's a, an important thing to check. Now, the first thing you run it, maybe you get an error message like this. So if you pay attention to the error messages telling you how to fix it, so you need to generate a package log file, which is generated like this. Uh, and then you run npm audit again and you will get like some findings about outdated uh, vulnerabilities, right? And, and if you will see that in Electron, you have like remote code execution <laughs> vulnerabilities if it is outdated and so on, right? So this is an, an easy way to get vulnerabilities. And another thing is to look for vulnerabilities in configuration, right? So for this, you can use the vulnerable one application. So you can click on this uh, from the slides. Now if you're using like the whole free access thing. and in the package.json, this is the first file to look at. You're looking for main. So main will be the main entry point of the application. And in this case, it's a file called main.js. Now, the thing to look for on main.js or whatever it's called on the application is new browser window, right? So I, show, I showed you in a slide before that for every window that the application opens, there's a renderer process, right? So this is the renderer process, the new browser window, right? So when the browser window is open, one of the parameters is the web preferences, and this is where you can tighten the security. In this case, there's, <laughs> there's basically no security because uh, these settings are bad, right? So I'll explain now why, why these are bad, right? So node integration is enabled, which is bad, because now with XSS, you can access all the Node.js APIs, right? So you can execute operating system commands and stuff like that. So 
this increases the impact of any XSS from alert one to code execution, right? So it's a pretty big difference. Uh, and then context isolation is disabled, which is also bad, because uh, basically the JavaScript of Electron is running in the same context as the JavaScript that the user is running, right? So if you have an XSS on the render process, this XSS can mess with Electron, right? So we will see uh, attacks against both of these things uh, today. So does anybody see a vulnerability here? Inner HTML, very good. So we have a DOM XSS vulnerability here, right? So the application receives a message from the user, assigns it to inner HTML, which is a DOM XSS sync. If you're interested in this, you can search for DOM XSS wiki, and it, ha it hasn't been up, uh, updated in a few years, but the DOM XSS wiki has like a lot of syncs, even jQuery syncs and so on. So this assignment uh, is what is causing a DOM XSS vulnerability here, right? So DOM XSS wiki, you can check it on GitHub. You can also search for DOM XSS wiki on Google, and it will be the first result. It's pretty good. Uh, and then another thing would be to look for vulnerabilities in Electron, right? So there's this uh, company called Doyensec who maintain this tool. So you can do npm install doyensec slash electronegativity dash g. So dash g installs it globally, which is what you want here, because you want to run it uh, as a tool in your system, right? So when you do that, it's already installed, and then you can run it against the vulnerable one application that I'll show in a second. And then when you run this, it will look for lots of vulnerabilities in Electron, so you will get lots of findings like this, right? So let's do a quick demo about that so that it makes more sense. <clears throat> so <clears throat> first, I'm just running NPM audit on a very old project um, that I showed in the slides, right? So you can get like some critical findings. So you have no idea about Electron, but you just run NPM audit and now you have findings, right? So <laughs> so this is, this is good, right? A quick way to get started. Now, in the configuration, you open package.json, right? So this is the file I'm opening. And in here, you want to look for main, right? So uh, I'm just going to search in VI for main. So that takes me to this line. This is the main entry point, it's main.js. So now I can go to main.js, or maybe I think I have it here. So I can open, well, first I would open main.js. And here you can search for browser window. So in here you can see there's a new browser window. These are the web preferences, no integration. Any XSS will be code execution. Context isolation is set to false. Any XSS will be able to mess with JavaScript in Electron, right? So I'll show examples of that in a second. Uh, and then in here we have the XSS. So this is the vulnerability, and this could be one way to fix it, right? So if you, instead of assigning the message to inner HTML, you're sending to text content, then there's no XSS, so you're safe, right? Um, and now electronegativity, uh, you can run it like this, electronegativity dash I, and then the whatever directory where the vulnerable application is. In this case, it's vulnerable one, so looks like this. And now we will get some findings. Now, since this is for those of you who are not very familiar with Electron, one thing to mention here is that um, Electron Reactivity tells you what the vulnerability is here. It tells you what file it is. The location is like, this is based on the results from line seven to line 21. And you have an issue description, right? So you can open this in your browser, read more about that type of vulnerability, and now you have like some findings, right? So you can, uh, get started with this, right? So this is these are like some essentials so that you can get started and, and find some cool stuff, right? So now with that out of the way, let's make this more interesting and start hacking stuff, right? So <laughs> what does XSS mean in a desktop application and how to turn XSS into code execution, right? Which is what we want here. So um, for this exercise, I'll be using again the vulnerable one application now, the first time you install um, an Electron application, this is just the code. So what you need to do is you create some directory, you cd into that directory where the application is, and then you have to run npm install, right? So npm install will look at the source code, it will look at the package.json, and then it will say, okay, this is an Electron application, 
So I have to download Node.js, uh, the correct version of Electron for this application and so on. So this will download all the dependencies for the application. And only after this has been done, then you can NPM start and that will start the application, right? So once that's done, now we can try some uh, payloads. So script alert one, SVG alert one, and so on. And to debug uh, a very cool trick to now in Electron applications is you can do control shift I, or if you have a Mac, command shift I. And this will open the developer tools the same way that you have the developer tools in your browser. So if you're wondering why your XSS is not working, you can uh, troubleshoot uh, using this, right? So when you try these things against the vulnerable application, you will notice that they don't work. And you will be like, but, but why, right? This works against the web application. Well, this is according to the RFC, because since the page has already been rendered, even though the injection is completely working, right? You can see there's no escaping anything here. It's still being rendered as text, right? So, well, it's not rendered as text. I mean, you can see this, that the injection is working, but there's no alert, right? So, uh, so then you're like, why is this happening? So this is according to the RFC. If the page has already been rendered, uh, script and SVG will not execute, right? But we can work around this by just using an image, right? Because the image, it has to render. So the uh, application will try to render the image and then you use the event handler <laughs> or neural alert one and now you have the alert one, right? So now we have XSS, but this is still just alert one. It's not uh, very scary, right? So let's take this to the next level. Now, since uh, the application has no integration enabled, I told you any XSS is automatically code execution, right? And the reason for that is that node integration allows you to call Node.js stuff. And when you can call Node.js stuff, you can do require, child process, exec sync, uh, calculator, or, you know, or ls, you name. Or you can even put like multiple commands with semicolon here. Uh, and a lot of stuff, right? So this is just one example to run commands, which is normally, uh, you know, what you use in, in Appendix report. But you can also uh, do require file system, read that C password, or require another Node.js module that does something else and do something else, right? So this is just to run commands, which is pretty cool, but just to mention that you can really load any Node.js module because this is what node integration is about, like you are able to load uh, Node.js modules, right? So with that, uh, now instead of having an alert one, you have this, which is which is a little bit cooler, right? Like you can see like some action on blood and stuff, right? So now if you are a developer or you are a good pen tester putting good recommendations in pen test reports <laughs> that uh, developers can actually fix, right? Uh, one of the things, like you, you should view security as, as an onion, right? So you want to add layers of security, right? So first, a first layer of security would be to disable node integration, right? So you can go into the main.js, disable node integration. So this will reduce the impact of the access. You still have an access which is bad, but at least it will not be code execution immediately, right? So it's a little bit better. So when you do that, and then you try the image, uh, and you try the attack, you will get here an error message, require is not defined. So if you get this error message, it means no integration is disabled, right? Now you cannot require any Node.js module I want to do what I want, right? This, this will not work anymore, right? So this is the first layer of defense, disable node integration. Now, second layer of defense, you can also use CSP. Right now, you are maybe more familiar about CSP on the web to, um, prevent XSS vulnerabilities, but you can also use CSP on mobile applications and desktop applications because CSP you can also configure through the HTML, not just a header on the server, right? So if you try uh, alert one, you'll see you still have the alert one, so we still have XSS, but you can go into the index HTML and instead of using a header as you normally would uh, on a website, you can also use like this HTML and now we have CSP. Now, CSP is its own topic, so we cannot go very deep here. But uh, just to mention, it helps you with this type of mitigation. So if you try this again, now you have to close the application, run npm start again. Now you will see this error, this error message. Refuse to execute inline event handler because it violates the following content security directive, blah, blah, blah. Right? So now content security policy is reducing or making the XSS much more difficult to exploit, right? So this would be another layer of security. Now after this, 
you should actually fix the vulnerability, right? So this will be the next layer. <laughs> this is the, the proper layer, right? But uh, you do the other two things in case you forgot some exercise somewhere, right? So just to, you know, I'm not uh, <laughs> saying that you should only do the other things, just the other things are good to do in case you forget some, right? Uh, but this is the, the proper fix, right? So fix the XSS. Now, the best way would be to avoid XSS syncs. So instead of using inner HTML, you use text content that fixes the XSS. So this will be a proper fix. But what happens, so if you try this, now you will get like all the XSS payload. This is rendered as text and the escaping is correct. So, uh, you know, there's no XSS anymore, right? So this will be the proper fix, but what happens if you have a rich text editor or some crazy requirement that you actually need to allow some HTML, right? In those cases, you can use some uh, library that will sanitize the HTML for you, right? So one example of that is Don Purify. You can get it from GitHub and uh, you can actually install it, right? So you go, you go to the vulnerable application, npm install Don Purify, and here you will have a new dependency of the application, don't purify. And then in the code, you do don't purify require don't purify. And now you still assign to inner HTML, but you do don't purify sanitize of message, right? So this will remove anything that looks like you're trying to exercise the thing, right? So this is pretty cool. You can also use this uh, on a website if you have like any website that needs some HTML. And even a better way to use don't purify would be to pass the parameter where you only allow certain tags, right? So that will be even better than this, but just for demonstration purposes, this is uh, enough. And then when you try this, you will see that, okay, the image is there and so on. So you still have the injection, but the owner alert one has been removed, right? So, so this would be what to do in those cases, right? So with that, um, let's show this. So you need first to run, uh, so I need to do npm start from the vulnerable one application. Uh, so it's basically simulating a chat application when users can message each other, but for demonstration purposes, we're just messaging ourselves, right? Which is a sad thing, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 but, but, you know, uh, just, you know, it's easier for us to debug this way, right? So, okay, so let me just go here. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to try all the payloads at once so that you don't uh, suffer me uh, mistyping here stuff. And I'm just basically going to send all the messages. So you can see here the output of the different payloads. So this is the output of the ls command here, right? Um, this is the output of uname-a, which is here, right? So you can see we can run any command we want with node integration. Now this one that is taking a little bit longer is the genome calculator. I don't know, you know, if they are doing some uh, Bitcoin mining there while they launch the calculator or what, but uh, it takes a little bit longer. So, uh, but you saw, you see that it showed up. Now since the um, genome calculator doesn't return anything, now we get a, a blank alert. Also, I forgot to mention earlier that you want to execute um, functions synchronously uh, in general against Node.js applications and so on, so that the command is executed, it waits until it finishes and then it gives you the output because many times, especially against Node.js applications, when you're testing a website, uh, if you don't use the synchronous function, maybe your command execution is working but you are not actually getting the output, right? So you want to always shoot for the synchronous functions for that reason. And this is the output of the ID command, which is here, right? So, so yeah, so that shows you uh, that. And yes, okay, and now we will talk about other cool stuff. So now let's talk about attacking preload scripts, right? So what happens if you don't have uh, node integration enabled, right? but there's no context isolation. So for this, we will be using the vulnerable to application, and this will be demonstrated against uh, Windows, right? Because Windows has some interesting property that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, this will also be interesting for those of you doing red teaming and stuff. So, 
what is not inter uh, what is context isolation right so by default this is still the default of electron app so by default everybody is like vulnerable to this type of attack that I'm going to explain so by default you have a preload script which is a script that um, electron applications normally use to do some initialization of stuff right and in here you can have some JavaScript that does things so for example you can do window ABC equals one to three and then the index HTML, which is where your XSS will normally run. Uh, if you do alert window ABC, you can actually read this one, two, three. This is because there's no isolation, right? So the security, well, security control is not exactly the same, but there's basically no isolation. So this JavaScript here can read stuff from here and can, basic, can also even mess with Electron, right? We talk about that more <laughs> in the course, but it's actually possible to mess with the inner workings of Electron, its own JavaScript code to get code execution even in those cases, right? Now, if context isolation is set to true, then uh, this JavaScript here and this JavaScript here are running into two different contexts. So if you do window ABC, uh, alert window ABC here, you will get that this is undefined, right? So, so this is better for security and uh, if you are managing uh, Electron applications in your environment, you should talk to your developers so that they do this, right? Because this will increase security a lot. Now, what happens if context isolation is set to false? You can mess with the Electron application, right? So if the Electron application has a check for uh, using the index of function, you can redefine the index of function. So this is a type of prototype pollution uh, against the desktop application. So using XSS, you can redefine how the index of function works in JavaScript, so it always returns lead. And then when the user clicks on this, uh, it will actually work, right? So this, this will make more sense in the demo. So I'll just show you in the demo. Actually, let me start the VM because it will take a little bit. Uh, so this, I think this VM will know soon. Uh, <laughs> um, OK, so the way this uh, works is the in the safe protocols. So, <clears throat> so when you open uh, a link in Electron, um, the link, uh, if the link is, for example, a file URL, uh, this would be dangerous to open in Electron because, uh, especially in Windows, there's this technique that you can provide a file URL from a network share, and the file is has a Java extension, right? So. This will give you code execution without warnings in Windows, right? So if you have like an exe file and the user gets a warning like, hey, do you really want to uh, run this and so on? This is not code execution, this is social engineering, right? You are fooling the user to bypass, you know, to click through security warnings. It will be the same as arguing that the SSL certificate uh, is invalid, but the user clicks through the warnings. It's, it's not, you know, like the... The browser is doing what it should, which is showing the security warnings, right? And that will be like social engineering, you're fooling the user to click through warnings. Now, this is true code execution because the user will not get any warning, right? If the user clicks on the link, it will be code execution without any warnings whatsoever. So the only social engineering is just the click on the link, right? Uh, so this is true code execution. And the cool thing to be aware about here is that in a real attack, this would be like attacker.com or something. And in Windows, if Windows sees that there's no network share, it will fall back to WebDAV, right? So you can have your attacker server, which is a WebDAV server, and it serves these Java files, and it's open for anybody to open the, your Java files, and then you can get this code execution, right? So this is a, an interesting thing to, to be aware about. So the application is actually doing this correctly. It's defining the safe protocols, and it's saying, Okay, I'm going to open the link using shell open external. So shell open external is basically an electron way of saying this link, open it in the operating system, right? So if this is a, a sync and this can result in security problems, especially if it is a file URL like here. But if the protocol is HTTP or HTTPS, this is fine because this will be open in the browser, right? So what the application is trying to do is using the index of function and saying, if the URL is HTTP or HTTPS, then open, in, open it in the operating system, because this is OK. This is safe, right? So this is what the application that I'm going to show is trying to do. And when you send a user a message like uh, with a file URL, 
it will say this link is unsafe, which it is, right? It, <laughs> it is unsafe. So, uh, so yeah, so let's try its demo, and I think it will make more sense. So, uh, all right. Can you see that? Yes. Readable? Yeah? Good. So, okay, actually. Um, ooh. Oh, okay. So I have to actually npm install. So yeah, if you try to run any of the applications and you get some that error message, think about npm install first, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you need you know to install the stuff. If you just have the code, uh, it won't work. Now I can do npm start. And now this will open um, the vulnerable application, All right? So first, uh, I'll just clear this. It's a little bit easier to understand. And in here, so let's try this first, right? So it makes more sense. So one user sends to another this message, hey, look at this, right? So, you know, whatever, you can be more creative, like it's a cute card, whatever, right? So uh, you click that, um, and it should say, wait a second, now, let me just try this again. This should say that the link is unsafe. Second, I think I'm on the wrong app. Uh, yeah, the problem of life demos and the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Is it vulnerable one or vulnerable two? Don't remember now. Uh, NPM start. So. So you send the message, you click the link. Yes, okay, so it's this one. So now we are getting this error message, this link is unsafe, right? Because it is unsafe. You, you shouldn't be opened in Windows because it will be code execution, right? So uh, the application is doing this correctly, but how how is this working, right? So if we go to the code, you can see that the same protocols array, and then there's this index of uh, check here, right? So. Let's break it down. So if I go and I replicate the application logic, so I go in here and I do safe protocols, right? I'm defining it the same way. And now you do safe protocols of index of HTTP. You can see this would return zero because it is position zero of the array. If I put HTTPS, now we get position one of the array. And if I put here anything else like file, now we get minus one, right? So this is what we are going to attack that because there's no context isolation, we can mess with this, right? So we can send a message like, hey, look at this, right? But now we send the XSS as well. And now the XSS is redefining the index of function to work in a different way. So now we can bypass the logic of the application because index of will always be lead. Now what happens with this? is now before, uh, well, now you can already see it here, uh, before this would be minus one and now it's lit, right? If you do it, if you do it with HTTP or HTTPS, it will always be lit, right? HTTPS is always lit. So now, if I click on this, instead of getting um, this leak is unsafe, we are getting the Java file executed. So now we have code execution without warnings on Windows, right? So. This is a pretty cool uh, attack vector to know about, and this is what uh, I've just demonstrated now with uh, attacking the preload script by redefining functionality on the pre on the preload script, right? So this preload script is actually not exposed to the user. This is something that Electron runs before uh, this is launched, but we can mess with any JavaScript in here because there's no 
context isolation, right? So if I go to the main.js here, uh, you can see this is the uh, plural.js, but here we have context isolation set to false, right? So this is what I have just uh, attacked here. We have five minutes, is it? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, okay, so with this uh, out of the way, let's talk about the last scenario, which is code execution through inter-process communication, right? So I told you before, the main process is more privileged, and sometimes you can get code execution in the main process, right? So for this attack to work, we need two requirements, right? So the first requirement is that the main process has some uh, IPC listener that is doing something dangerous, right? So in this case, it's waiting for an event called get update. So you can see where this is going, right? So it's getting, it's looking for an event about retrieving an update and it expects a URL to get the update from. And then the renderer process has to expose this IPC stupidly, like for example, <laughs> defining some function like window electron send to send anything to electron, right? And then you can, this is basically a wrapper function to call an API that would normally not be available from XSS called IPC renderer send, right? So this would be on the preload script, right? Uh, but because the preload script does this, now with any XSS we can electron send and send stuff to the main process and now we can say, hey, there's this update, this is the URL, and then you get code execution, right? So that is basically what we're going to do here. So this is a Linux reverse shell. Uh, so you basically send the user a link like this. Now this link has some uh, basic like JavaScript here, just a, a script tag, and then you just do electron send get update this uh, you know reverse shell uh, bash script, and then the application will download this. It will give it executable permission. It will run it, and now you have your reverse shell, right? So. Uh, so yeah, so other possibilities could be Electron open in browser or open URL, something like that. And now this is doing shell open external. So here you could do with an XSS, you could do Electron open in browser file URL, you know, <laughs> and now you have like code execution without warnings uh, on Windows, right? Or Electron listen, Electron send. So there's different ways that they could do this. So I'll just show you here how this attack works. So basically, first, there's this get update event, then this triggers, now in JavaScript, everything is event-based, so, <laughs> so you have an event for will download, right? And then there's like some code here, uh, and then there's like, the application saves the downloaded path, and then once it is like updated, and um, you know, the situations are, uh, correct, so at the end there's like one event here for state completed, right? And then when it is completed, it will give it executable permissions, and then it will run the update, right? And then the update, instead of being an update, is just basically your reverse shell, right? So, uh, so yeah, so and this is like the attack vector, and this is basically the code of the reverse shell, it's just uh, creating an input output file on TMP, and then just redirecting the shell, which is an interactive shell, you want to redirect uh, standard error output to standard uh, output so that you can see the error messages. And then you pipe this to the non-hacker version of Netcat that most servers will have. Uh, this would be uh, attacker.com because in the hacker version of Netcat, you could just do execute sh uh, bash, for example, right? But here, uh, this would be like, you know, the, the non-hacker version of Netcat. Uh, and then you just uh, redirect this to, to the same file. So this is one of the many results that you will get in Google if you search for Linux reverse shell one-liners. So uh, this is a very popular one because it doesn't require any special tools uh, on the server, or in this case, the victim computer. And then in some terminal, you will get the, the shell back. And that's it. And this is how the attack would work. You basically some message the user, you click on this, uh, and, and that's it. Right, so in the terminal you will see something like this. Get update, this is the download path of the downloads of the user, download successful, running update, and then on the other terminal you get the shell, uh, and then the password and so on. And I think the demo, uh, in the VM I have here has a problem, so <laughs> I will not risk it. Uh, and in here, you, you basically can get all the slides, the vulnerable applications I've shown here, and everything here on server security comes last free. 
uh, and that's it. And if you want to get in touch, you can do it that way. And if anybody has any questions. Any, any questions? All right. Thank you so much, Abraham. Thank you.